There we go. Yeah, okay. Do you all see Duncan? Yes. Okay. This is what Duncan looked like when we first got him. He had been, his mouth had been taped shut. He was almost dead. His face was cut in half, and they had to sew his face back together again. And uh, he was the right mess when we got him. But now he's an absolutely loving, wonderful dog. And um, we have six non-human refugees who live with us. Uh, most of them were abused dogs. Um, love can conquer anything. So go out and get a dog and adopt a dog or a cat or any other animal of any species that nobody else wants. Uh, and give that animal lots of love and that animal will become your very best friend. So one of the most important things that we can do as animal advocates is take care of particular animals of whatever species. So please, uh, as we go into the holiday season, remember something. The best gift that you can give is a home to someone. So uh, think about that as we go into that season. All right, now I am ready to start the presentation. Paul, can you bring me back? Yep. Okay. Um, I realize a lot of my work is controversial because it focuses on why welfareism and 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 why, why the large groups are basically doing the wrong thing. And I know that that upsets a lot of people. And 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 I want to try to explain to you perhaps one of the most controversial things that I talk about and explain to you that it's really not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. And I want to explain to you why it's a matter of fact. In particular, what I want to do is talk to you about the idea that, um, that, that single issue campaigns and welfare reform campaigns, are they necessarily promote animal exploitation. A lot of animal people just don't understand that. They just don't understand that these campaigns, these reform campaigns, these single issue campaigns, they actually promote animal exploitation. And that's why we should reject them. There are other problems with them, but the most serious problem is welfare reform campaigns, single issue campaigns, actually promote animal exploitation. Paul, if you get me back to my, my, my presentation, I'm gonna take people through it now, okay? Okay. Uh, and, by, and Anna Charlton, who did this presentation with me, is gonna be joining the conversation at 10 o'clock, or at 3 o'clock your time, we're going to have a question and answer period. All right, first of all, what are reform campaigns, welfare reform campaigns? Well, they are campaigns that seek to make animal exploitation more humane. Things like enriched cages, more space for veal calves, etc. What are single issue campaigns? Well, they are campaigns that target particular animal products or animal uses, and they advocate for the abolition of those products, but not for the abolition of exploitation generally. So we have campaigns that seek to get rid of fur or foie gras, etc. Those are single issue campaigns. Many animal welfare or many animal advocates see these things as baby steps. Um, and what I want to argue is that they're not only not baby steps, they're counterproductive. They necessarily promote animal exploitation. Why is that? Because all of these campaigns require coalitions. We have to have coalitions, okay? The coalitions will have some vegans, but they'll have lots of, of non-vegans. So you'll have a campaign that, that combines vegans with non-vegans. The only way the non-vegans are gonna support that campaign is if the message they get is whatever they're doing is okay. And what others are doing, the people who are the target of the campaign, whether it's a welfare reform campaign or a single issue campaign, are not okay. Okay? That's the only way you get a coalition to, to, to support these campaigns. You've got people on, in those campaigns who are vegans. Sure, some of them will be vegan. Those will be mostly the people who work with the organizations that are promoting the, single, the, the welfare reform campaign and the single issue campaign. But there will be lots of members of the public who aren't vegan. And so they're joining the campaign because they think what they're doing, you know, if they're going to buy cage free eggs, they're better than the people who are eating conventionally, uh, conventional battery cage eggs. Okay? So a campaign for enriched cage eggs has to communicate the message that eating happy eggs is okay and eating conventional battery eggs isn't. A campaign against blood rot has got to send the message that those who eat animal foods other than foie gras are morally okay, sorry for the misspelling, I'm okay, 
or at least better than those who eat foie gras. So it's basically, you know, oh boy, we think it's terrible that other people are eating foie gras while we're eating our steak or our chicken or our fish. That's the way those campaigns work. What the campaign cannot do is have the coalition members think, sorry, to say think, not think, that they are no better than those who participate in the targets of the campaign. So you can't have, you can't have a campaign where you're telling people who are eating chicken if, uh, oppose foie gras with us, but we think what you're doing in eating chicken is every bit as bad as eating foie gras. They're never going to support that campaign. They're never going to contribute to that campaign. They're never going to contribute money to that campaign. This sends a very clear message. It necessarily promotes that, that the idea that reform exploitation uh, or the animal products that are not the subject of the single issue camper, campaign are better than. So, so what you're saying in an anti-fur campaign, you're saying wool is better than fur. You're saying leather is better than fur. You're saying in a welfare reform campaign, you're saying cage-free eggs or enriched cage eggs, which is now the norm in throughout the European community, enriched cage eggs are better than battery cage eggs. Okay, uh, uncrated pork is better than crated pork, but that sends a normative message that it's okay to, to, to consume those products, and that promotes animal exploitation, because people are not going to support the campaign if they think that what you're saying is that what they're doing is every bit as wrong, morally wrong, as what you're going against in terms of the subject of the, of the, of the campaign. So. You know, reducitarianism. I know that that, that is the subject that um, you're going to be talking about at VegFest, uh, if you haven't already. Um, but reducitarianism, it sends the message that it's morally acceptable to consume animals as long as you consume less meat. That is a terrible message to send. Here, this is taken, these three shots are taken from the Reducitarian website. This is not my, this is not coming from me, this is coming from the Reducitarian website. This is Matt Ball. Matt Ball started an organization called Vegan Outreach. He now works for Farm Sanctuary. He says, you can go a long way towards making the world a much better place by simply choosing to eat fewer animals. What message does that send? It sends the message that it's okay if you're eating fewer animals, you're a morally good person. That promotes animal exploitation. That promotes animal exploitation, okay? Here's, a, here's a, a quote from Vicki Moran. During my 13-year journey, journey from omnivore to vegan, I wish I'd known the term reducitarianism and that I was already helping the planet, consuming fewer animals, and giving my health a boost. It's a lovely concept, leaving no one out and doing a world of good. Now, people, think about what sort of message does that send? How can that be interpreted in any other way that is saying that if you eat fewer animals, you're a good person. So it's okay to continue to consume as long as you consume fewer. And she's actually saying, during my 13-year journey, I wish I had known it. It would have been a good thing. You know, I mean, how can that be understood in any way other than as saying that it's a good thing to eat fewer animals and it's okay to continue to eat animals as long as you're eating fewer animals. Here's a quote from Melanie Joy. Carnism, the invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals, blocks our awareness and empathy so that we act against our deeper values without realizing what we're doing. Reducing our consumption of animals to the greatest extent possible reduces carnis carnism's influence on us. Now, again, think of what she's saying. First of all, I disagree with her completely. I don't think that there's any invisible belief system that conditions us to eat animals. I believe it's very explicit. We embrace it. It's called the animal welfare uh, uh, approach. We've had it for the better part of 200 years. It is the position that it is, it is all right for us to continue to exploit animals as long as we exploit them humanely because they do not matter as much as us. There's nothing invisible about, about that. It's quite explicit. It's quite explicitly a part of our thinking about animals. But the way Melanie is portraying this, she's, she's, she's suggesting that somehow we suffer from some sort of disease and that we're all, you know, we are all unable to see what we're doing and that if we can 
unless we, it, you know, it'll actually have a great impact on our inability to see. That, I'm sorry, but that is not only nonsense, but what it's doing is promoting the idea. It's, it's almost saying, eat less meat, and it's okay for you to eat less meat because you're, you'll, become, you'll recover from your suffering of carnism. I mean, how does that not send a normative message that is very, very detrimental? Okay, single issue campaigns also promote human discrimination. They are terrible in that respect. Why? Because the coalition all require us to say that what we're doing is better than what they're doing. And what they are, the people that, you know, that usually the, 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 the people who are involved, um, who are the subject of these campaigns are oftentimes poor or they're oftentimes vulnerable groups. So, you know, uh, halal and kosher slaughter, for example. So we go after Muslims or we go after Jews and we're better because we eat stun animals. They don't eat stun animals. The Taiji dolphins, you know, we, the Japanese are worse than us. They do bad things. You know, it's again, it's the, you know, it's the, the Jewish other, the Muslim other, the, the Japanese other. You know, this, this, this campaign about eating dogs is bizarre to me. Is it wrong to eat dogs? I'm sure it's wrong to eat dogs. But it's no more wrong to eat dogs than it's wrong to eat pigs, chickens, cows, fish, you know, whatever. And so this idea, though, that the Asians, the Chinese, the South Koreans, they're bad people because they eat dogs. And so these, these are really, really detrimental campaigns. What we're doing is okay, uh, but it, it, it's better what they're doing. Here's a statement from Viva, my friends at Viva, on Halal Slaughter. Um, just look at the bottom of you know, the second sentence of that. Consumers can do their bit by boycotting places that persist in selling meat from unstunned animals. So that does that has, has a that has two problems. First of all, it it promotes human discrimination because it suggests that people who eat halal meat are worse than people who eat stunned meat. If you've ever been in slaughterhouses that have stunning and slaughterhouses that have halal, they're all horrible places. And the idea that somehow halal or kashrut is worse than the stunning of animals indicates that when people say that to me, I always assume they know nothing about the slaughtering process because stunning animals is a horrible way of killing them as well. Many animals are not fully stunned when they're, when they're butchered. It's a terrible, terrible situation, but in any event. So it suggests that we're better because we eat stunned animals than the Muslims or the Jews who eat unstunned animals. But it also, I mean, again, this is an explicit example. This is a quote from Viva in which they're saying that consumers can do their bit by boycotting places that persist in selling meat from unstunned animals. So go to places that sell meat from stunned animals. Go to restaurants that don't serve halal and, uh, uh, or kashrut, but they serve dead animals and eat those dead animals. That's how you can do your bit. Again, this promotes animal exploitation. Enough, here's, here's a, this is probably the most famous uh, fur campaign uh, uh, poster that ever existed. It's been, I, I remember this one from 25 years ago. Uh, it's, it's shown up literally millions of times. It takes 40 dumb animals to make a fur coat, but only one dumb, well, only one to wear it. And who is it? It's a woman. You can't read it. It's not a very good picture. I'm sorry. But she's got a skirt, she's got black stockings, she's got high heels. It's a, you know, and you don't see her head because we don't think about women as thinking beings. Um, we only think about them as body parts. And there she is, the body part, dragging the fur with the blood. That is incredibly sexist. There is nothing, fur is bad. It is no better than or worse than wool, leather, silk, or any other animal product. And the idea, I mean, the fur campaign has been one of, has resulted in tremendous sexism and misogyny. It's a terrible campaign. It never should have, we never should have had it. We certainly shouldn't have it now. It should be a campaign to stop the use of animals for all clothing. We should never be targeting fur. Again, here, this is, I just love this one. Those who wear fur have no respect for life. So if you wear fur, you're like Adolf Hitler. But if you wear leather or you wear wool or you wear, wear silk, you're just fine. Um, now, uh, sometimes people say, well, isn't it the same with human rights campaigns? You know, don't human rights campaigns, aren't they single issue campaigns? For example, if I have a campaign against, um, against, uh, 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 genocide in one country, 
And isn't that, you know, the same sort of thing? I'm not including all countries. So isn't that a single issue campaign? And we always think it's all right to have a campaign against genocide in Darfur um, without necessarily having a campaign against genocide in Somalia. Um, but, but, you know, so isn't it the same with humans? And the answer is no. Because when we have a campaign um, against the targets genocide in Somalia, it doesn't address genocide in Burundi or any other country. It's not the case. Nobody is saying that that we ought to stop genocide in Somalia, but genocide in Burundi is okay. Okay, nobody is saying that. Nobody would understand the campaign that way. Whereas when you have a single issue campaign or a welfare reform campaign, the only way it can be understood is to say that if you're, you know, it, if you're if you're consuming conventional battery case A then you ought to stop doing that and you ought to consume enriched cage eggs instead. So that's the only way a, an enriched cage campaign can be understood. It, it's not understood in the same way that a campaign about human genocide is understood. And the reason for that is we all think genocide is bad. So the starting position is genocide is bad. So if I say to you the genocide in Somalia is bad, you're not going to understand me to say the genocide in Burundi is okay. You would never understand it that way. Okay? Um, whereas when I say to you battery, conventional battery cage eggs are bad and I'm promoting enriched cage eggs, the only way you can understand that is to understand me as saying enriched cage eggs are okay for you to consume. Okay? Again, we don't need, you know, we don't need a coalition. When we when we when we have a, when we build a coalition against genocide, we don't have people in the gen, in the coalition who think that genocide somewhere else is a good idea. So when we have a, when we get a group of people to oppose genocide in Somalia, we don't have people in that coalition who say, oh gee, you know, I think genocide in Burundi is okay, and I think that the people in Somalia ought to aspire to the methods of genocide uh, to, that the people in Burundi use. That's not what happens, but with animals, that's exactly what happens, okay? Now, there are other things wrong with these campaigns. They don't do very much at all. They're phased in over a year. I mean, look, I mean, the, the case in point is the, the, the battery cage initiative in Europe. It took 12 years. It still is not implemented in a lot of places. And it basically does very, very little. The difference between a conventional battery cage and an enriched cage is very, very, very small. As a matter of fact, some years ago, Compassion and World Farming put out a big report saying that the enriched cage could not address the welfare problems of the conventional battery cage. They had that report, and then they, they basically decided to ignore it and to pursue the enriched cage uh, 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 situation because they thought that that was realistic and they could get that done and they could fundraise off of it. Now, Compassion and World Farm, which opposed the enriched cage egg, is giving awards to companies that use enriched cage eggs. So you tell me how that is morally acceptable and how it's not promoting animal exploitation. Bottom line is, the welfareist approach and the single issue campaign approach is not working. It can't work. Oh, can, I, can I come back to the audience for a second? Am I back? Hello, everyone. Um, it, it can't work. Look, we've had animal welfare reform for the better part of 200 years. It started in Britain, and we've had it for 200 years. It's not working. We are exploiting more animals now at any, than at any point in human history. More animals in more horrific ways than at any point in human history. It simply doesn't work. You know, it's interesting. I remember when I first got involved in the movement, and that was like 35 years ago, um, the big issue was fur. You know, everybody was, that was the big issue. That was the big single issue campaign 35 years ago was fur. And now, 35 years later, the fur industry is stronger than it's ever been. In the, in the 1970s, when I lived in England, you could walk, you, you, you didn't see much fur in the streets of London. Now you see it all over. 
So single, these single issue campaigns don't work. Another big single issue campaign is the campaign against against the use of animals in experiments, vivisection. There is more vivisection now in Britain than there was in in 1980. So I mean, it doesn't work. These approaches don't work. So the question becomes, what is it that we, you know? What should we be doing instead? And the what we should be doing instead. Paul, put me back to the to the um, to the PowerPoint, please. Am I back? Okay. What do we propose? Veganism. It is very important, and I don't mean the way that Viva promotes veganism, or Animal Aid promotes veganism, or PETA promotes veganism. I mean the way abolitionists promote veganism. The other, those other schools promote veganism as a way of reducing suffering. So they basically say, we ought to try to reduce suffering. So veganism is a way of reducing suffering. Vegetarianism is a way of reducing suffering. Case-free eggs is a way of reducing suffering. Great free pork is a way of reducing suffering. I say that is nonsense. I think we ought to be taking a very clear position. If you're not vegan, you're participating directly in animal exploitation. You're either vegan or you're participating directly in animal exploitation. Those are the only two choices. Now, it's not a question of journeys. It's, I, I tell you, if there's one word I would like to see out of the English language, it is the word journeys. It is a mischievous word. It is a terrible, terrible, and what it, what it conveys is this idea that it's all right for us to continue to exploit animals as long as we're on a journey. Now, think about how species is that. What if I said to you, you know, you know, I'm a racist. I hate people of color. But you know, I'm I'm gonna not tell racist jokes on Monday. I'm gonna have a racist joke-free Monday. And and I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey towards no racism. And that's what I'm gonna do. You would say, what are you talking about? That is insane. You know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be promoting racism. You shouldn't be racist. And I'm glad that you are trying to stop being racist. But we should never condone gentle racism. But when it comes to animals, all of a sudden, you know, moral absolutes just go by the wayside and everybody's on a journey. Everybody's on a journey, you know, to, and, 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 and I suggest to you people that that's a very speciesist way of looking at it. We would never look at a fundamental human rights violation, a fundamental human rights violation, I'm talking about genocide, slavery, rape, child molestation, those sorts of things where you, know, you can't analogize this to social welfare reform where you know where in you know uh, next year the you know the Scottish Parliament might decide to increase welfare benefits. That's not a matter of journey. That's a matter of saying you've got a group of, of people who have rights and we're trying to figure out how to how to facilitate and promote their rights. That's not what we're doing when we're talking about journeys with animals. Because that's that's like saying we would apply journeys to the context of a fundamental rights violation. We don't do that. Let's think about the issue of rape. If I said to you, gee, you know, I rape six women a week, but I'm going to cut down. I'm a reducitarian. I'm going to cut down and rape only five people. You would say, oh, good job. You're on a journey. Nobody would say that. That would be insane. Nobody would say that. But yet, we do say that when animals are concerned. Somebody says, I eat meat 43 times a week. I'm going to eat meat 42 times a week. And then we've got Vicky Moran saying, oh, that's great. You're on a journey. And we've got Melanie Joy saying, oh, this is wonderful. And we'll help you reduce your carnism. I'm sorry, people. But we would never do that in the human context. It is species to do it in the non-human context. So I think what we need to do is we need to promote in a non-violent, creative way, vegan education. That's, I think, what we need to be doing. We need to be promoting the idea that veganism is not extreme. It is just common sense. Paul, bring me back to the, to the group, please. Am I back? Okay. Um, I want you to think about this. You know, all of the large groups, they all say, well, you know, veganism, it's hard for people to be vegan. You know, and, and you know, it, it's extreme. The answer is no, it's not extreme. And no, it's not hard. It's actually very easy to be a vegan. All you need to do is eat fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, beans. Okay? It's easy. It's cheaper. You can learn everything you need to learn about vegan nutrition in about two hours. 
Okay? It's nothing complicated, and I'm tired of animal people portraying veganism as some extreme thing, some difficult thing. You know, I mean, it's very easy, particularly in 2015. It's very, very easy. And I think we need to be educating people about the fact that veganism is not, it's a matter of common sense. And this is how I explain when I'm talking to an audience of non-animal people. What I generally do is I say to them, you know, I use an example, I use some example that's been in the news recently of somebody who's done something bad to an animal. And and I, I you know, and the example that I use a lot in the United States is Michael Vick. Michael Vick is an American uh, football player. And he, in 2007, he was arrested because he was running a, a dog fighting ring in Virginia. And he was actually sent to jail for a couple of years. And everybody is still angry with him. Whenever he shows up any place, animal people are there picketing him. And everybody hates him. Um, and so I generally use Michael Vick because he's very familiar to the, to the British audience, uh, to the uh, US audience. There are people, there are, I, and when I've been in Britain, I've used different examples. Um, one example I use a lot in Britain, although it's becoming a little bit stale, is Mary Bale, who was a woman down in England who drew a, a cat in a waste bin and they caught her on, uh, on, on closed circuit TV. And, and so she was, you know, in the Daily Mail, there were all these, uh, you know, there, I mean, you know, she was vilified all over Britain, and indeed outside of Britain, because she did this horrible thing to the cat. She didn't kill the cat, but she, she threw the cat in the bin for several hours, and the cat was obviously not happy about that. And so, um, so I, I always start off with an example like that. And, and everybody in the room will agree that it's wrong what Michael Vick did, or what Mary Bale did, uh, or you know whatever whatever example that they use. Um, and uh, there was an example actually. I used a Scottish example a few months back in an essay I wrote. And I'm sorry, I just don't remember for the life of me um, who that was. But there was somebody in Scotland that everybody was upset about because he done something to a dog or a cat or a horse. I don't remember what it was. But so what I do is I use the example. And I say, look, we all think this is wrong, right? And everybody in the audience says, yeah, it's wrong. I say, well, why is it wrong? And then after four or five minutes, somebody will hit on the answer I'm looking for, which is that it was wrong to do because it, it, it involved an infliction of suffering or death on an animal for no good reason. And so I then always come back and say, okay, great. How many vegans are there in the audience? And maybe two hands will go up out of 100 people. Maybe I'm lucky. And then I say, well, but wait a minute now. You just told me that Michael Vick is a bad guy because he killed these dogs and he had no good reason to do so except his entertainment. He enjoyed it. And I said, so how are you any different? And then everybody looks at me like I've got four heads and I say, well, wait a minute, let's go through it. And then I put up information about nutrition. I say, you don't need to eat animals to be optimally healthy. And I go through all of the organizations, all of the government organizations, all the professional organizations, and I explain. I explain that none of these organizations say that you need to eat meat, dairy, any animal products to be optimally healthy. You know, I talk about the fact that I've been vegan for 33 years. I have more energy than most of the, the students I teach who are young enough to be my grandchildren now. <laughs> I'm getting older, and you know, and, and, and you know, I have more energy than they do. I can't remember the last time I was sick. The idea that, you know, I mean, I, I cannot understand how anybody can maintain that animal foods are healthy for you or that a vegan diet is not healthy. For you. That's the point. The point is, I don't really care whether eating animal products, a small amount of animal products, is something you can do. That's not, not what's important. It's important that you don't need to eat any. You can be completely healthy, as healthy if not more healthy, by not eating any animal And then I talk about the fact that animal agriculture is an ecological disaster. And then when I get the group to see, after about 40 minutes is that they're in no different position from Michael Vick. He liked to watch, you know, he liked to sit around a pit watching dogs fight. We like to sit around the barbecue pit roasting the corpses of animals that have had lives and deaths that are every bit as violent and painful and horrible as the animals that are used in dog fighting or they have lives that are certainly worse and deaths that are worse because the cat in Mary Bale's case was not killed as the cat, as, the, as that cat. But the bottom line is the best justification we have for inflicting pain, suffering, and death on over 60 billion land animals a year and a trillion sea animals, a trillion, a million, million, that's a trillion, that's a huge number of animals, is that they taste good. And you know what? People understand it. You know, 
I don't get into, I've discussed, you don't have to get into a lot of philosophy, you don't, I, mean, I do that kind of the university, but you don't have to get into a lot of philosophy. It's a simple idea. It doesn't require a great deal of understanding. It's, it's simple. Anybody can understand it. A child can understand it. As a matter of fact, children probably understand it better than most of us understand it. That it's simply wrong to hurt something, particularly when you don't have a good reason. And we don't have a good reason to eat them, to wear them, to use them for entertainment purposes. The only, the only use of animals that we make that is not transparent and frivolous is the use of animals in science to find cures for illnesses. And I, I don't agree with that either. I, I, would never, I would not kill one mouse to find a cure for cancer. Not that that would be possible, but if it were possible, I still would say no. You can't make that trade-off. But at least you have to have a discussion there. That, that requires a more complex discussion, a more philosophical discussion. But with respect to the eating of animals, the wearing of animals, the using of animals in, in body and in personal care products, all that sort of stuff, there is no, absolutely no need for that. The only justification we have is that it's wrong to, is, 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 that, is that we get pleasure out of it. And that goes against our fundamental moral principle that everybody accepts, whether they're vegan or non-vegan. If you go around, walk, walk around Glasgow today and ask people, not now, because I want to stay put now, but at, later on, go and ask people, do you agree with the proposition that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals? And you know what? I will bet you a pound that you will not find anybody who disagrees with the proposition you know, that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. Well, we can have an interesting discussion about what necessity means, but if it means anything, it means you cannot inflict pain, suffering, and death on animals for reasons of pleasure, amusement, or convenience, and people, those are the only justifications we have for killing 60 billion land animals and a trillion sea animals every single year. Those are the only justifications we have, and they can't be justifications if we really believe that it's wrong to inflict unnecessary suffering on animals. So the bottom line here is this is not an extreme idea. It's common sense. It's complete common sense. Most people understand it. When you explain it to them, and you explain it to them in this way, they do understand it. Paul, can I come back to the to the PowerPoint? Am I back? Okay. Now, I want you to look at these numbers. According to the Vegan Society, unfortunately, the Vegan Society actually banned me. Um, I have the I have the dubious distinction of being banned from the vegan society because I got upset that they were not promoting veganism several years ago. I pointed out that they were accepting paid adverts for non-vegan restaurants in their magazine, and they got so upset they banned me. Um, but in any event, the vegan society they, they, there was an online discussion group, and I was prohibited from participating because I promoted veganism. Um, According to the Vegan Society, there are 150,000 uh, vegans in the United Kingdom. I think that's a low number, but let's take that number. If every one of those vegans in the next year persuaded one other person to go vegan, we'd have 300,000. And then if they did it, 600,000. Then there'd be 1.2 million, then 2.4 million, then 4.8 million, then 9.6 million, 19.2 million, 38.4 million, and then 76.8 million, and you've got a vegan UK because there are only, you have a vegan UK and and you have more because there are only 63 million people in the UK. So the bottom line is, if each of us, everybody sitting out there today, if in the next year you persuade one other person to go vegan, and every single one of you can do that, we know that. Every single one of you can do that. If every single one of you persuaded one other person to be vegan, and every vegan did that in, in Britain, we have 300,000 vegans next year, and then we'd be on a roll, and in a short number of years, we'd have a vegan United Kingdom. Now, let me come back to the, to the uh, 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 look at that, and then um, I want to discuss with you what the abolitionist approach is. Uh, that's the first principle. Um, Paul, can I come back to the group? Okay. The... What I want to argue with you is that we need to make veganism the central focus of our advocacy. We got to get rid of all this 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 welfare reform stuff, these single issue campaigns. We have got to focus on grassroots. We don't need these large organizations. They are multi-million pound organizations. We don't need them anymore. We have we we first of all we have the internet, which is probably 
Um, I mean, it's got good aspects, it's got bad aspects. But one of the good aspects of the internet is it has basically reduced the cost of communicating with each other. You know, when I first started this 33 years ago, 35 years ago, whenever I did it, if I wanted to go talk to somebody, I had to go talk with them. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't talk with them by Skype. Skype didn't exist. Computers didn't exist. I mean, they existed, but they weren't, they weren't available for use like this. And so we now have an internet where we can all communicate with each other. You know, I mean, we've got, there are communities, we've got an abolitionist community building all over the world of people who communicate with each other over the internet, who give each other activist, you know, creative, nonviolent activist ideas. Um, it's just wonderful. We don't need these big organizations anymore. What are they doing? What are they doing? All they're doing is promoting welfare reform campaigns, single issue campaigns. You know, they're, 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 they're not doing anything productive. As a matter of fact, I believe very strongly that these large organizations are not only not pushing things forward, they're actually pushing things backward. We have right now something called the Happy Exploitation Movement, where you know we are all now into this idea that what we need to do is focus on the humane treatment of animals, and we, you know, and we got compassion and world farming, giving awards to people who use cage free or enriched cage eggs. We have the, the RSPCA with the Freedom Food label. We have Viva, Viva participating with Whole Foods in in in, in formulating a humane slaughtering, humane raising and slaughtering procedures. This is pushing things backward. What this is doing is making people feel more comfortable about animal exploitation. So what we need to do is to build a grassroots abolitionist movement. What I do, what I suggest is that we build it around six simple principles. Okay? These, this is this is how this is you know something I have developed over the past 20 some odd years, this abolitionist approach. Um, let me explain these six basic principles, and then you can, in the question and answer period, uh, ask, ask me and Anna Charlie any questions that we have. The first principle is that it's all sentient beings have the right not to be used as property. Think about it. How, whatever disagreements we have about human rights, we all agree that, it's, that slavery is wrong. All of us agree that slavery is wrong. We all see slavery as a qualitatively different form of abusing human beings. Why is it qualitatively different? Because if a being is a slave, then that being has no, no, that, that being is a thing. Slaves are things, they are not persons. They are not, persons are those who have inherent moral value. Slaves do not have inherent moral value. They only have external, extrinsic, economic value, okay? So they're not persons, they're things. And as a result, they have no rights. They can have no rights. Their value is determined only by their, their owners. And so we all recognize, however much we may, you know, we might have disagreements about, you know, the national health system. We might have disagreements about, you know, whether Corbyn would be a better uh, prime minister than, than, um, you know, than, than uh, Cameron. Uh, we can have all sorts of political disagreements, but everybody agrees that slavery is wrong. That everybody agrees that that slavery is wrong, um, and and everybody agrees that all humans irrespective of how smart they are, how not smart they are, how beautiful they are, how, how uh, whatever, whatever their personal characteristics, every human being has, has at least one right, and that is the right not to be property. We've abolished slavery. Now, it still exists in certain parts of the world, and but nobody defends it anymore. Whenever it's found, people criticize it. Nobody says, oh, well, slavery, you know, it could be okay. Nobody defends it. Everybody agrees it's wrong. We need to extend that to animals. We need to extend that to animals and to recognize that animals have one right, the right not to be proper. All sentient beings, human, non-human, have the right not to be proper. But when we apply that in the non-human context, what it means is we have to stop treating animals as things, which means we must stop eating them, wearing them, using them. That recognizing that one right, that one right not to be property, means that we have to abolish all institutionalized animal exploitation. Paul, oh, can I have the um, part from that? Am I back? Okay. The second principle, recognizing that one right requires the abolition of animal exploitation, so that means we don't support 
welfare campaign. We don't support single issue campaigns because if it's wrong to exploit animals, period, then telling people that it's right to exploit them if they do it humanely is wrong. And it also doesn't work. I mean, as I mentioned before, it promotes animal exploitation, it makes people feel more uh, comfortable about exploitation, and it is doing nothing. As a historical matter, there is no proof whatsoever that animal welfare reform is reducing exploitation or is causing people to not exploit animals. That is nonsense. If anything, it is making people feel more comfortable about it. The third principle, and animals matter morally, we are committed to veganism as a moral imperative. Paul, can I come back to the group? Okay. What I mean by that moral imperative is that it's a moral rule. It's not, it's not a question of whether you're on a journey. It's a question of what you have a moral obligation to do right now. And you have a moral obligation to be vegan. If you believe animals matter morally, if you, if you accept it, now if you think that they're things, if you believe that animals are things, I really can't, I mean, you know, I mean, if you believe that people of color have no moral value whatsoever and that they should be enslaved, there's very little I can say to you. If you really believe that, there's very little I can say to you. I can't make you care about things morally as a result of rational argument. If you, but if you believe animals matter morally, and I believe that, you know, that most of us do. Uh, there are very few people who really think of animals. There are some people who think of animals as things, but most people don't. Um, and so if, if animals matter morally, we are committed to veganism as a moral imperative, as a moral rule, as a baseline. It's not a question of it's simply a way of reducing suffering. It's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's a moral imperative. It's something that we ought to do. Just as we would say that racism is, is, a, you know, is a bad thing. We have, it's a, equality is a moral imperative. We don't promote gentle racism gentle rape, gentle pedophilia. We, 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 we talk about these things as moral imperatives, moral rules. You know, it's wrong to be racist. It's wrong to be misogynist or sexist. It's wrong to assault or batter people. It's just wrong to do those things. We don't talk about, about gentle forms of exploitation. We say morality requires no exploitation in those countries. We need to do the same thing with animals, but that means it's veganism. This idea that, you know, I, I, I always go through, I, I cannot stand when I see veg, veggie, you know, V-E-G, star, N, and all that sort of nonsense. It's vegan. It's a simple word, vegan. I mean, you know, say it, say it. Vegan, vegan. Let's all say vegan. It's easy to say vegan. And, and um, you know, the, vegetarianism is an incoherent moral principle. Think about it. There's no moral difference between meat and dairy. Animals, animals kept alive for dairy. Our animals used for dairy are kept alive longer. They're treated every bit as badly, if not as, you know, if not worse than their meat counterparts. And they all end up in the same slaughterhouse anyway. I mean, the idea that there's this distinction between meat and dairy is ridiculous. There's no distinction between meat and dairy. There's no distinction between meat and eggs. As a matter of fact, the eggs have the second highest death rate per thousand calories. You know, for every thousand calories of eggs that you eat, you are responsible for more animal deaths than you are for any other food except eating chicken directly. So I mean, this idea that you know that well, you know, if you're a vegetarian, that's okay. No, it's not okay. If animals matter morally, veganism is the only rational response to that perception. Paul, can I have the um, can I have the next slide? Or can I have the my back? Okay. Um, only sentience matters. That's the fourth principle. Okay, bring me back to the group, please. Um, only sentience matters. Am I bad? Okay. Only sentience matters. Uh, by that I mean this idea that elephants matter more because they're smarter or because they're more like us, or you know, dolphins matter more because they're more like us, or that you know, or whales matter more like us, etc. That's nonsense. The only thing that matters is sentience. The idea that animals like the great apes or dolphins or whales or whatever, the idea that they matter more because they're more like us is like saying that light-skinned people of color matter more than dark-skinned people of color because they're more like us white males and we're the standard. So this idea that, you know, I mean, all that matters is sentience. Cognitive or mental capacities other than sentience may matter for other reasons. I mean, you know, they're made, you know, a, 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 a great ape might have different interests from a dog or a fish, but that doesn't mean the great ape matters more in terms of morality. That doesn't mean that it's okay to eat the fish, but not to use the the, uh, the non-human great ape in, a, in an experiment. Let me have the uh, 
Back my back, please, Paul. Animal rights and human rights are inextricably intertwined. Please, can I come back? My back? Okay. Animal rights and human rights are inextricably intertwined. By that I mean that we take the position that animal rights, you know, is that, you know, those of us who believe in animal rights, we reject speciesism. Why do we reject speciesism? Because it's like racism, sexism, heterosexism, you know, classism, etc. It excludes beings from the moral community using irrelevant criteria. Well, the same thing is true is if, if we take that position that speciesism is bad because it's like racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, whatever, it means we are committed. You know, we have to reject those things as well. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you have to now never do anything about animals and we have to work on other human rights issues. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Work on whatever issue you want to work on. I tell my friends in human rights who do human rights work, keep doing your work in human rights. But when you eat, eat vegan. When you go out and buy your next pair of shoes, don't buy leather. Don't buy fur. Don't buy wool. Don't buy silk. Keep fighting for women's rights. Keep fighting for children's rights. Keep fighting for international human rights. Whatever you want to do. But just do it as a vegan. And to my vegan friends, to my animal rights friends, I say, look, when you're fighting for animal rights, stop violating human rights. Stop the sexism. Stop the misogyny. Stop all this cheap, sexist nonsense that I see all of these groups, all of these groups promoting, um, you know, all of them. Well, you know, PETA started it um, in, the, you know, in the late 80s, late 1980s. PETA started that rather go naked than wear fur campaign. And now that's mushroomed into what I think is a hideously misogynistic uh, set of sexist campaigns, but it's gotten over to Britain, Viva does it, other groups do it, um, you know, this, these cheap, sexist, misogynistic campaigns have got to stop. Any, you know, these campaigns that target Muslims or target other groups, they're wrong. We've got to stop dumping on the Asians because they eat dogs, we eat pigs, we eat chicken, we eat, I mean, you know, what, what sense does it make to have a campaign against the Koreans eating dogs? When you got people in that campaign who are going to go home and say those damn Koreans while they're eating their steak, what sense does that make? Not only does it not make any sense in terms of the animal movement, but it is racist, it is xenophobic. You know, it encourages hatred of the Asian other. We don't need that, right? You know, we don't need that particularly now. We don't need it, period. It's bad. It's wrong. It's, 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 it's totally wrong. We've got to see that animal rights and human rights are inexplicably intertwined. Can I have the slide? Okay, animal rights is about nonviolence. Okay, bring me back, please. The problem that we are fighting is violence. We're not going to we're not going to deal with violence with more violence. If violence was the answer to problems, we'd all be living in the Garden of Eden right now, because the history of humankind has been one violent episode after another. The history of humankind is drenched in blood, and it hasn't gotten us anywhere. And so I think we need to accept that animal rights is, is, is I see it as the new peace movement. I see it as the all-encompassing peace movement. Okay? It doesn't mean pacifism. It doesn't mean that we, we don't stand up. It doesn't mean that we aren't, that, that we don't we don't clearly state our message and that we don't state our message in very direct ways and that we're pacifists. It means we do not engage in violence. And you know, it's interesting. Um, some years ago, I was speaking at, uh, at a Canadian university and a woman uh, who identified herself as working with the North American Animal Liberation Front support group asked me the following question. She said, if a vivisector is using 60 dogs a year uh, in experiments, isn't it acceptable to use violence against the vivisector because the vivisector is using violence against the dog? And I said, let me ask you a question. I said, um, is your mother a vegan? Are you a vegan? She said, yes. I said, is your mother a vegan? And she said, no. And I said, what does your, I said, you know, what food, what animal foods does your mother eat? And she didn't understand why I was asking her the question, but I, I, I insisted that she answer. And she said, um, well, my mother doesn't eat beef. And I said, good. Okay, fine. Wonderful. What does she eat? And she said, she eats chicken. I said, does she eat chicken more than once a week? And she said, yes, she eats chicken many times a week. And I said, okay, your mother is more responsible, is responsible for more than 60 chicken deaths a year. Is it okay to use violence against your mother? You know, because if it's all right to use violence against the food sector, it's all right to use violence against your mother. And she said, no, they're not the same thing. And I said, really? I said, could you please explain?
explain to me uh, what the difference is. And um, she couldn't, and she can't, because there is no difference. So this idea that it's all right to use violence against people who are using violence against animals is really a problematic, um, uh, a problematic argument in all sorts of ways. Um, the reason why farmers uh, raise animals is because we demand them. Okay? If there was no demand for meat or dairy or eggs, they would not be providing. They're capitalists. They're, they're basically they, they, they will they will do what is demanded. Okay. Um, same thing with with vivisection. Vivisectors do it because we want the supposed cures. I don't think that vivisection produces anything useful. But even if it did, I would still be opposed to it. But the bottom line is, is that is that people want, you know, people are willing, you know, they eat all this garbage, they eat all the rotting flesh, the cow mucus, the chicken ova, they make themselves sick, and then they want cures, they want somebody to give them a pill. There, I mean, the public wants vivisection, so as long as the public wants vivisection, there will be vivisectors doing it. The problem is not the farmer or the vivisector, the problem is us. We need to change how we think about animal ethics. We need to become creative, nonviolent advocates for veganism. Now, um, bring me back to, if you want further information, I have three sites uh, that you can get at, uh, my back on uh, is the, well, okay. theabolitionistapproach.com is where I have a lot of essays, there's videos, there's, there are all, sort, all sorts of materials for you to get, there's um, descriptions of books, copies of articles that I've written and things like that. Uh, HowDoIGoVegan.com is a site that we launched a few months ago. It is going crazy in terms of its the number of hits it's getting. Um, it's become very popular. It's basically, how do I go vegan? When somebody says to me, how do I go vegan? I tell them, go visit that site. It tells you everything you need to know about going vegan. All the practical things. You look at that thing, you look at that site for two hours, you, have, you know everything you need to know about how to go vegan. I have a discussion page um, that uh, at Facebook, uh, the Abolitionist Approach, which you can come and I spend some, I have a bunch of really good moderators, uh, many of them from the United Kingdom, and um, and I uh, I have a, a bunch of good moderators. I participate in it to the extent that I have time. I discuss things with people, and um, in either today or tomorrow, or the next day, I'm not sure exactly what. Uh, we are going to be uh, publishing a new book called Animal Rights, the Evolutionist Approach, and it's a beautiful piece of artwork that uh, British artist Sue Coe did for us. Um, she did it just for this book, and um, and she did another piece which is going to be on the back cover, and that will be available um, as of uh, sometime this week probably, but we'll make an announcement. It's the, the book is done, we're just doing the final things on it. Paul, I'll bring you back to the group. Am I back? Thank you. Um, I want to thank you very, very much for listening. I hope I have not upset. I mean, a lot of you are probably involved in large groups. Um, you know, again, I, I'm. You know, look, I have a different perspective. If you think my perspective is wrong, you got to tell me why. It's not enough to say, well, you know, he, he he disagrees with the large group. The bottom line is, if you look at the world and you think things are better for animals than they were 10 years ago, I couldn't disagree with you more, because they're worse, and they're worse than they were 10 years before that, and 10 years before that. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. We need to change, we need to shift the paradigm, we need to we need to move away from the idea of animals as property that we humanely treat to animals as persons at, that we do not exploit at all. We need to make veganism a normal thing. We need to get people away from this idea, promoted by the large groups, that it is extreme, that it is difficult. It is neither extreme nor is it difficult. It is easy, it is something anybody can do. Our job is to teach them, our job is to show them that they already believe everything they need to believe to conclude that veganism is the way we ought to be going. I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank Tim. I want to thank Alan. I want to thank Paul. All of my friends in Scotland, as a matter of fact, many years ago, I debated a vegan sector at the University of Glasgow. It was one of the first animal things I did. It was in 1984. I was scared to death. Um, and it got such, it was, um, it was controversial, and the following morning I was on uh, uh, TV4 uh, ar 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 arguing about animal rights, and I thought I was going to die. I was absolutely terrified. But I have wonderful, wonderful uh, memories of Glasgow, uh, of Edinburgh, and other, of the islands and the borders. Um, and I just love Scotland. I wish I could be there with you. Tim says I will be there with you next year, and I'm going to hold him to that promise. Peace. Thank you very much.
discussing just about anything uh, so even if you think perhaps the question could be a bit challenging I'm sure you'll be welcome uh, because what we're trying to do here of course is encourage intelligent debate on all of these aspects uh, and then make our own minds up as to what's the best way forward so Gary will be back in about five ten minutes I should think um, could you just give Gary a little ring is that possible just to call him just tell him what 